Are we on? Good morning, everybody. Uh, and welcome to this new roundtable of discussion with uh, John Hopkins University uh, School of International Advanced Studies. My name is Harvard de la Rue. I am uh, a senior fellow uh, at the Foreign Policy Institute uh, here at SAIS. I'm also an executive director of uh, the North Africa Initiative uh, at John Hopkins, which is uh, sponsoring or both of them size and, and the initiative for sponsor, for sponsor of this event. Uh, I welcome all of you. I see a lot of friends and experts here and students and colleagues in the room. We still probably have more coming in. Uh, we are not exactly the best. We're not exactly Swiss here in Washington in terms of timing. <laughs> so people will be scrolling in, but we have a very large audience already uh, online. This is being broadcasted live by size and also our colleagues at the IMF. Uh, the format is a very simple, straightforward uh, format. Um, I will start by asking His Excellency, the Ambassador of Algeria, Mohammed uh, Hanouji, to, to open up and discuss and open the Hanouji, my apologies. That's true. I forgot that. And and we will. Uh, so he will uh, uh, share with us his thoughts about the region and the political economy uh, of North Africa, the challenges it's facing. Then I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Jihad Azuri of the IMF. Uh, he's the director of North Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia at the IMF. Um, and, you know, uh, I'm sure most of you who follow, uh, follow him and follow the IMF and Lebanon know all the discussions and talks about trying to push him to become the president of Lebanon. So you can you can count that you, if, if that happens, that he will be the, you met him here. Uh, then we have uh, our colleagues from the OECD. We have uh, Mary Rosa Lonti uh, and also uh, Elena Francois, who will also join us after uh, the words of Dr. Jihad. And then we'll open it to a discussion both from me and the audience here and also online. Um, so this is a format. We should be finished in about an hour and a half. Uh, and uh, so welcome to all of you. Thank you all for your time uh, and sharing your thoughts. Let me start with you, Ms. Uh, your Excellency Ambassador Hanish. 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 Okay. So uh, uh, who is new, by the way, to Washington? This is one of his first uh, appearances in public. So let me start with you asking you your thoughts about the region, the challenges it's facing, um, sort of any, any insight or thoughts that you want to share with us. Yes, good morning, gentlemen, first of all. Uh, I'd like at the outset to command the issue of Dr. al because it's not very often that in Washington we visit the issue of integration within the Maghreb area. Maghreb area is uh, fortunately, an area which is not known except when there are problems, like in India, Western Sahara, Mali, etc. Otherwise, well, it's never on the spot. So I'm very happy that for once we have the opportunity to discuss uh, the issue of integration. Given the fact that when we talk, when we envisage the idea of integration in the Maghreb, we should not be confined only in economic elements. We should also talk. We are obliged in open various, various different security issues regarding the Maghreb. I don't have the intention here to uh, embrace all those aspects. Nevertheless, I will put the emphasis on some ideas. Just to give you a second, just to give myself a second. It would be uh, useless to seek to count the blame on the non maghreb cost on a single party, as the responsibilities in this matter are very complex. We've been talking of integration for half a century, ladies and gentlemen, and we've not been delivering. I look at this issue as a collective failure. Very clearly, it's a collective failure of all governments, of all civil societies, civil societies which Curiously, 
are culturally very integrated. We have the same language, the same slangs, for instance, between Morocco, Algeria, and Morocco, the same dialects, uh, the same languages, Arabic and Berber, uh, the same political orientations, more, more or less. And we are not achieving, contrary to what is happening in other areas in the world. So we have to ask the question why? It is true that over the years, we have been trying, we have been trying and successfully to launch initiatives of operations uh, regarding this integration, starting with partial integration and thinking of total generous and ambitious integration, like the one which is written in the statutes of the uh, Maghreb Arab Union, Imam. Umar, which refers to Umar, the idea of nation in Arabic. So the message is that it's supposed to be very strong here. Let's start at the beginning. The Umar was created in uh, 89 of last century with a very ambitious uh, concept on which I have to say that we agreed all, all countries, civil societies also that were involved, agreed on the idea of starting the economic integration, a whole integration, because at the beginning we have signed 38 treaties and agreements. Being convinced that in a couple of years in this process, we would be able to, let's say, likely what happened in the European Union, we would be able to mount the momentum and then get to real integration. Unfortunately, it has proved that the conditions being different, we are not able to operate the same way because the first problem that occurred, the issue of Western Sahara, fortunately was going to block the process starting from 94, until now, we have been stuck in this problem. Why, if we get back to the past, I remember clearly that there was a political consensus saying, let's go achieving the Maghreb Arab Union and let's forget or let's convey the difficult issues like the regional problem <coughs> of Western Sahara to the United Nations who are enough competent in order to be <coughs> given the fact that this is a global political problem that should be treated within the United Nations. And it is indeed. It's been treated within the, even though without success, it's been under the responsibility of the United Nations. And regarding Western Sahara, uh, I don't want here to indict or accuse in this thing because it would be useless to just like that. But in 94, December 94, Morocco took on itself the historic responsibility of conditioning the Maghreb Union process to a solution of Western Sahara to get his at its advantage. And from now, from this point, come all the difficulties that there was a tendency to try to bilateralize the issue of integration in the Maghreb and to reduce it in, into a political problem between Algeria and Morocco. Of course, we had problems in the past between Algeria and Morocco. And needless to get back to those problems, okay? They are enough known. But as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, what remains is that the issue of, of the issue of integration was a lot definitely about we are stuck in a situation in which I don't know how we are going to get a breakthrough because there is a precondition put by Morocco saying if you don't accept my conditions on how to solve the issue of Western Sahara, I'm not gonna move. So under those conditions, how are you going to proceed? We've been trying to open dialogue many times, and I'm talking on behalf of Algeria, and I'm, I'm giving you facts. For instance, uh, uh, as far as I can remember, in 2005, we were embarked, Algeria and Morocco, with an 
a virtuous process of rapprochement. We had many exchanges of high ranking delegations, ministerial delegations, and we ended up at last, a week before organizing the summit, the summit between the prime minister of two countries, we received the Fortunately, notice from Morocco saying that as long as Algeria is not changing its posture, position over the East Western Sahara, we are not going to continue with it. And the same situation occurred, uh, and basic, I, uh, what I'm saying is based on facts, on the facts, in 2012, during the uh, Arab riots. So, okay, uh, exactly, we went through the same process. All of a sudden, uh, it was blocked by the uh, Fortune Initiative of Morocco saying, as long as you are not going to change your mind. Definitely, it has to be known that Algeria is not going to change its mind on this issue of secondary relations. Uh, if you take the issue of Western Sahara, what are we asking for? We're just asking for a political solution based on the national law. That means the right of self determination of the Sahrawis. That's all, not more, not less. We are the only country in the region, this is sort of paradox, that is not claiming any part of Western Sahara. And we have stated very clearly, we have taken the commitment that with respect to Western Sahara, we don't want anything. What we want is stability because we are a neighboring country, we have a problem of refugees in Algeria, we don't want Algeria to be involved in a negative process of destabilization, especially that in the area of the Maghreb countries, we lack many things, but we don't lack elements of destabilization. Like there's a big problem, a huge security problem in Libya, Western Sahara, in Mali, in the region of Sahel, we have national and international responsibilities. In terms of stability, I think that Algeria has a special role to play, and we are fulfilling our duties completely, fighting terrorism, stabilizing the region, helping uh, the Sahel countries, helping also our uh, brotherly countries, like in Libya, in which you are playing an important role, and trying to make a rapprochement between the various factions. Best we give factions, stop the killing, stop the crisis, and go to a reconciliation policy, which is absolutely obligatory. Okay? It's very, there is no way to escape it. So there are so many problems. This is why I started my uh, remark saying that it could be maybe from the methodological, methodological point of view, useless to just focus on the shade of the economic aspects. My conviction, ladies and gentlemen, is that whenever there would be a solid political platform, then the integration will be talking. Then it will be even, then it would be easier, a lot easier to start a true, an authentic uh, process of economic integration that would last exactly, I'm not saying the same, that the world that happened in the EU that was based on other aspects, structural uh, aspects. But we have the possibility in uh, the uh, Maghreb countries, as long as we can <coughs> together set sort of solid political consensus <coughs> over the necessity, first of all, of building common economy, second thing, the meeting some political problems, some that have relation with international affairs to the United Nations, especially the Western Sahara issue. Because that preliminary much. Thank you very much. I, I want to add more. <laughs> Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think you gave us a picture of the, of the politics of the region and what is called the back in the region. And, uh, back to unpack it a little bit and, and, and so to understand a little bit more why is the politics becoming so difficult to break through that it's blocking the region from benefiting from the common or daily basic uh, advantages 
and how also uh, Europe and the United States have not really helped in this process, although they, they themselves will take advantage of uh, some kind of an economic integration, forget about the politics, but the economy. I'll turn to Dr. Jihad uh, Azuri of the IMF, uh, who will give us a little bit deeper understanding of, of the economic dimension of the region, its potential, the, also the infrastructure, both politics and actual economic infrastructure that is hampering it from achieving its, its potential. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, today. Always a pleasure to interact with students. Look, um, we're discussing a topic that uh, I think very quickly we will converge on, that this is uh, um, a low-hanging fruit, is to increase uh, regional economic integration in developing countries. We're talking about a region that has 100 million uh, population, uh, a region that if we add to Egypt, it would fall of the of Africa, strategically located uh, between East and West, uh, where uh, essentially uh, we've had advantages that can be um, Over time, uh, several things uh, taking place in order to promote institutionally the level of integration at the Maghreb country, uh, uh, country's level, as His Excellency uh, Ambassador was mentioning, but also broadly speaking at the African level. The recent one is the Great Africa um, um, Therefore, uh, from, I would say, uh, a raison that there is a clear reason that uh, increasing integration among uh, migrant countries. This will bring additional growth. We have recently estimated that this could bring uh, on a long-term basis, 1% uh, per year additional growth. This would create a certain uh, number of job opportunities for a region that is facing um, a relatively high level of unemployment, especially at the first level. Therefore, in terms of should we do it? Definitely, the reasons are there. Can we do it? Of course, because we are in a region that shares many uh, many things in common. Why we were not able to do? I think this is the big question. And here, I think it's important also to ask another question is, why now is important to uh, reopen the subject? Um, let me start with the last one. Why now? Over the last four years, the whole world went through uh, uh, successive severe shocks from uh, the COVID-19 shock and its impact on um, populations of the world, and in particularly, particularly in the region, and I will say a few words on that, to the recovery that brought with it high inflation that affected um, uh, the livelihood of people, and recently the increase in uncertainty because of the war on Ukraine and uh, the broad uh, risk of fragmentation. What does it mean for the region itself? One is throughout the last four years, uh, we saw increasing number of vulnerabilities. And let me um, take a few examples. The first one is the informal sector. Informal sector used to play a role of buffer during any economic shocks. And the COVID crisis showed us that the informal sector was not, in fact, the best way of shielding. Uh, low-income people, at the contrary. However, in the flip, of, the flip of the coin, we saw several initiatives that took place using technology in order to promote additional support even to the informal sector. The second element is unemployment went up. Uh, went up on average, uh, reaching, for example, in countries like Tunisia, 17 to 18%. And the real issue is for the youth, where youth unemployment is now exceeding 30 to 40% in certain countries. Therefore, um, COVID crisis has increased vulnerabilities and also changed also the pattern uh, of trade and the pattern of, um, I would say, economic exchanges. Um, it created new challenges, but also here it opened a certain number of opportunities. The challenges that were created uh, 
need to call for certain actions in order to mitigate them. Uh, some of those challenges, we have access to finance, which is relatively low in the region and need to be increased. The second challenge that was created is the technology proved to be very useful, but also technology was a divide but the, between those who have access to technology and those who don't. What were the opportunities? Globally, we saw change in the way global value chains are organized. And recently, with the risk of fragmentation, we saw change in the way regional cooperation are, are operating. We started talking about onshoring, reshoring, friendly shoring. And this region is strategically located. It's very close to Europe. It's the gateway to Africa. It has a very strong footprint in the Middle East and the Arab world. Therefore, from a strategic standpoint, this region has comparative advantages to provide. It has a um, wealthy, knowledgeable set of cultures and population um, that some of them are, in fact, um, both in certain startup industry or even in Europe, uh, are um, performing uh, very well. Um, therefore, you have the ingredients, you have the market opportunity because of the reorganization of the global value change, the reorganization of trade. The third key advantage that I think it's very important is the only way to integrate Africa is to integrate North Africa. This is one third of Africa in terms of GDP. Um, and there is no way to create those links between Europe and Africa without having the barriers between North African countries removed. How difficult the job is. In fact, it's not very difficult because what is needed to be done is to remove barriers. And some of those barriers when removed would not, I would say, change the political landscape. At, at the contrary, they could become or they could provide incentive to ease the political um, um, tensions, or you could start from another entry point. Historically, the, the region started thinking about integration from a political standpoint. I think using the economic angle by doing certain number of easy things, one, removing barriers, uh, and some of those barriers led to the fact that this is the least integrated region in the world, 5% integration, much lower to Africa where on average is 20%. Of course, if we compare to Europe or ASEAN, we're talking about 50, 60%. Therefore, we're starting from a low point, removing the barriers will easily increase um, integration and create a market that becomes attractive for international investors. Two, infrastructure. The infrastructure is on national basis, well established, but cross country needs to be developed. And this is also something that is needed because it will increase the attractiveness in using some of those infrastructure regionally and internationally. We have several strategic locations for ports, but still when you look at the traffics between those ports, it's very limited. The same thing also applies for air traffic, et cetera. Therefore, Removing barriers, increasing or improving the connectivity of infrastructure, increasing the connectivity of financial infrastructure to allow capital to flow between countries are low hanging fruits that do not require um, an important level of investment and the return will be much higher. Three is invest where the capital is and the capital is the human capital in the region. Um, I mentioned earlier, if you go to hospitals in Europe, you see that um, Algerian doctors, Moroccan doctors, Tunisian doctors, nurses are in fact um, in leading positions. Therefore, there are certain sectors, new services that can be promoted in the region. Therefore, I think removing barriers, improving infrastructure, creating uh, a one single market type of uh, uh, approach, those are elements that can be activated in the short term, create jobs in a region that needs some, increase the attractiveness of uh, uh, this, uh, I would say crossroad between Europe and Africa, between Middle East and the Atlantic, 
And um, I'm sure that this in itself will change the perception on how to look at the, at the migrant market. Again, I think also uh, we should not look only uh, Maghreb specific. We have Egypt uh, and some of the other African countries who are Arab African countries, which also one need to think about how to increase the level of, uh, of economic exchange and reduce economic barriers. Therefore, um, there is a long list and I could go longer in terms of describing why this is something that is doable, beneficial. The last point is why now? I think this is an important moment and here is my call for action. Why now is because of all what I mentioned above, because we need to create jobs, because the world is changing, because we can create jobs, and also because there are additional uh, opportunities that are coming. And where those opportunities, um, one could, I would say, uh, 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 promote them. One, the region, we look at it as, as a unity. The region is different. And even in terms of economic outlook, we saw countries now benefiting from the increase in oil price. We expect, for example, in our recent research at the fund, that in the next four to five years, we should expect more than $1 trillion additional financial windfall that will come because of the increase in oil price and the reforms that are introduced in the Gulf countries. This $1 trillion of additional windfall is currently seeking investment in the region. Egypt, Jordan, um, 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 and other countries um, are, um, uh, Iraq are in active negotiation uh, with the GCC countries to promote FDI. That, that's one trillion to MENA. To MENA, yeah. yeah. Did, you, did you break it out for North Africa? Uh, no, this is one billion that will be only for GCC. Oh, okay. This is additional revenues that will come for the GCC in the next four to five years. Therefore, here also, the nature of Arab integration or regional integration has shifted. It used to be very much top down, public to public. Now it's, I think it's getting more private to private and more in the form of private equity approach, um, which means that the role of the private sector is important, which also means it's very important to prepare the private sector for that. And this is also one of our key policy messages that we need to allow the private sector to lead. And this requires reforming state-owned enterprises, improving business environment, increasing access to finance that is relatively low in the region. Therefore, allowing a new approach of partnership is one way to, in fact, um, benefit from all the change and transformation that the uh, that uh, we are going to and benefit from the moment. This is the why now. The second reason why now is very important is because of um, the recent developments, especially where the fragmentation and risk of uncertainty are going to call for changes. And some of those changes will affect the way we produce, we trade, we store, we create, uh, I would say even security. Um, and this is going to allow countries uh, like uh, Maghreb countries to become more strategic, including in sectors that we have been neglected, um, the sector of agriculture. Um, since the war in Ukraine, we saw regain an interest in producing uh, or manufacturing agricultural products by European com companies in, in Maghreb countries, in countries like Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco. Uh, Mauritania has a huge potential in terms of also um, uh, mineral as well as also other type of, of commodities that are becoming now strategic. Therefore, um, this is now the moment to see how this global value chain is, re is being reorganized, uh, how the, um, the global order, the global economic order would allow the region like Maghreb countries to benefit. And three, there is also now um, awakening in Africa that integration economically is the only way, especially in the next decade to create jobs and to create growth. And as I said earlier, 
It's impossible to have an African integration without North African integration. The last point on why now is the fact that um, we see in terms of international assistance some shift because of the war in Ukraine. Therefore, you need to create um, more opportunities to attract um, investment, to attract um, capital. And this would require proactive policies by countries. Again, um, uh, taking a different road, which I would say, practically speaking, it's an easy road, which only requires to do some um, um, measures that will reduce only the barriers uh, that exist today. I think, and plan the medium and long term, and this is where a climate, for example, becomes an important opportunity, not only a risk, uh, because over the last two decades or three decades, the region has suffered a lot from drought, from floods, and therefore it will become a new opportunity to invest in a future that could create growth and jobs and protect population. We need to put it in a context of inclusion because um, where the young region that has highly educated young population, where the very limited women participation in the labor market, uh, if you remove the obstacles for that, you could create a new dynamic that could transform the region and could have even a political positive impact, not only in the, for the region itself, but for the whole Africa. Um, reducing tensions, reducing um, risks. And therefore, you need to look at uh, an old story in a different way. This is an old story. The integration in the Maghreb countries, it's an old story. You need to look at it from a different angle. And I think the time now is good for that. And let me stop here. Thank you very, very much, uh, Jan. You never disappoint. You always have a very, very key um, observations. There are a number of things that uh, Jihad uh, has pointed to that I'd like to a little bit unpack as we come back to the discussion. I've done some work on the integration both for the Maghreb and the Arab world uh, when I was at the World Bank. And, uh, you know, you, you hit on all of the key lessons we have learned in the past. I published an academic paper through SAIS a few years ago on this topic of integration. But it is, as, as you had mentioned, now is a good time to revisit it, given both the global and the regional dynamics. So we'll come back to some of these very key issues. And I am very particularly interested in how you had sort of mentioned that economic integration and the private sector uh, approach to it can actually lessen uh, the political challenges. So it, ca it can be, instead of being a block, it can actually help solve some of these political issues. I will, I will turn to our colleagues in Paris uh, from the OECD, and I would like if you uh, can start giving us, sharing with us your thoughts on this issue. Uh, and also, you know, if, we, if you can focus a bit on also the European dimension and it, the importance of North Africa to this. And, and one final point is please also include Egypt because uh, like you had mentioned, actually our initiative here includes Egypt as a part of North Af Africa. So we're talking about the whole region, not the region that is defined just the Maghreb. Uh, we're looking at the whole dimension of North Africa. Please, ladies, uh, I, I leave it up to you. I'll, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's, it's really a pleasure and honor to participate in this uh, round table. Um, uh, we're talking from the OECD, uh, who include um, many of the uh, member states of the European Union, but is not, the OECD is an international organization with a membership 
of 38 countries that span across uh, different uh, continents. Um, now, you, you, to answer your question, uh, I will refer to two uh, recent studies uh, that we did in cooperation with the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, which is an organization um, in, that covers the uh, 27 members state of the European Union, and then 16 countries in the southern and eastern Mediterranean. And among these 16 countries, uh, there are the countries of interest of this discussion, uh, and in particular, uh, Algeria, Mauritania, Morocco, and Tunisia, and Egypt, that are member states of the Europe, of the Union for the Mediterranean, and then Libya, that is an observer state. Um, so that I will first share with you some reflection that we hope can, can fit the discussion about the study that we completed uh, uh, last year, no, actually in, in 2021. Uh, which is a report on progress uh, of integration in the Union of, for the Mediterranean. So this particular union that includes a um, group of countries that include the European Union member state and then state in the Mediterranean, uh, southern and eastern Mediterranean. And this study wanted uh, at, as, a, as a purpose and it was uh, uh, it was prepared as um, as requested uh, as an official document in the roadmap for action of the uh, of the UFM um, organization. So <clears throat> the, the the aim was to to understand the progress of integration <clears throat> under different dimensions that I will now mention. Since the creation, since the launch of the Barcelona process, which was in 1995, uh, that um, was the first step in this reinforcing the uh, integration in the region with the aim of achieving a, a region, realizing uh, peace, stability, growth, uh, inclusive growth in this region. Um, so the, the, we did not focus uh, in this uh, uh, in this exercise in looking at the causes, I would say, of failure in the sense we didn't look at why the uh, integration did not advance so much also because there are many, many studies on that. There is, I think the, 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 the reasons are quite well known. And by the way, uh, the ambassador, the, the IMF uh, mentioned very, very rightly, already provided uh, a contest of why integration in the Maghreb, but, but uh, then more generally, is not uh, is not advancing. So what we we um, what we looked at is the what happened and what can we say about the um, the development uh, and how can we measure them? What is meaningful in terms of indicators and in specific aspect that would represent the integration in the in the in the region and the we, we focus on five different dimensions that uh, you will see are economic but not only economic dimension that cover also other aspects so there is uh, trade uh, finance, uh, uh, infrastructure, in particular uh, transport uh, and uh, uh, energy, then mobility of persons and uh, uh, higher education and research. And first of all, I have to say that the fact that we um, we looked at integration in this comprehensive way, I think it's, it's uh, not focusing on one specific aspect, in particular trade, which is the one most often cited uh, also because the experience uh, across the world of regional uh, 
integration most often are uh, confined to the dimension of trade and do not cover um, or cover few or no other other aspect of the integration. So the fact that we looked at these five dimensions because they are part of the vision and the ambition of the Union for the Mediterranean was itself, um, I mean, in, an important element to see to see the development, but also. Why not? And I, I'm uh, I'm starting with trade, where in fact we could observe that that uh, sure the we are far from the potential of integration that there is in this region. But in fact, we could observe um, development. Uh, so we, we in. In the past, we observed 25 years, and the conclusion was is things have evolved, uh, have evolved not only north-south, which was the major development, but to some extent also um, south-south in, in the members of, of the region. But also we observe development in terms of diversification of, of, of goods that were, um, um, were traded and to some extent also in terms of integration to, uh, to global value chain. But then the, the, what we certainly could see uh, in this exercise, uh, uh, horizontal exercise, is that the, um, the lack of appropriate uh, infrastructure and the fact that there have been development, and I'll, um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, my colleague Elaine would uh, elaborate more on that, uh, we observed a, 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 an insufficient uh, infrastructure for logistic and, and transport, multimodal transport, uh, something that would allow uh, goods once they are shipped uh, from port to uh, so multimodal transport means the ports that become gateways uh, to reach uh, not only special economic zones that are uh, typically close to uh, to port but also inland uh, region or and very importantly to reach uh, research centers uh, and university so for instance with this we realize that it's it's, it's an essential element and i mention it because the in a sense jumping to one of the reflection the conclusion that one cannot only uh, focus on uh, um, reducing or eliminating the, uh, tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, because there are other type of important uh, obstacles that would, any, in any case, not allow to to make progress if they are not uh, addressed. And one of these is also the um, uh, the limited uh, diversification of the industrial produ production in the different counties. So we observed some progress, but still there is a limit to what can be traded today, simply because in most of the, of the country, the, the offer is, is rather limited. Um, so the, uh, we, we uh, looked, I mentioned before, at the at aspect related to the mobility of people that include both uh, uh, migrants, both people that, that uh, um, move for uh, reasons related to employment, but also, also students uh, in research. And, and for instance, there we, we, we looked at the interesting experiences such as the circular migration, which was something that uh, um, has developed uh, uh, quite uh, substantially, especially north-south 
in, uh, in the region where migrants would go for a limited period um, and then for specific activity, typically in the agriculture, and then go back to the camps, which in principle could be a, 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 as they say, a triple win uh, solution approach because for the host country, for the sending country, and for the uh, for the migrant, but it it was not the case because of uh, um, because of the the type of agreements that are today implemented. So the, these are just. Uh, a, a few ideas that I'm, that I'm sharing uh, about this first report. And as I said, we, 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 we really um, see that, the, um, that all the elements are, are relevant and cannot be um, analyzed in a separate way if a progress in, in integration uh, are to be realized. And now briefly a second, um, a, a few words on a, on a second report, and it, um, I think we can then share the link or, or maybe they have already been shared with the participant. The second report is, uh, is called Navigating Beyond COVID Recovery in the, in the MENA region. And there it was a reflection on what has changed what or and what needs to be changed in the policy in the different countries uh, following uh, following the COVID? To, to what extent there is a need of a, of a shift in uh, policy? Uh, I'm um, okay. I'm asked to um, uh, to leave the floor to to Elaine because I'm uh, so to leave space for the for question uh, with pleasure, and I can come back on uh, on the second study later. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you very very much. Yes, uh, because we are already about an hour <laughs> in, and we need to uh, open the floor for some discussion before we our guests have to leave. So. Please, uh, uh, Elena, if you can. Uh, I will be quick. I will very be quick. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. And a lot has been said already. So uh, if you allow me, I will only add a bit of uh, an investment policy perspective to this very important uh, discussion. So as uh, you might already know, at the OECD, uh, our, at least at the investment division of the OECD, our mandate is to uh, support uh, governments in, in uh, reforming, uh, in strengthening their institutional and regulatory framework for, for investment and uh, to, uh, to create more enabling frameworks for attracting more and better investment. So our approach is very much geared towards uh, the sustainable development impact of, uh, of international investment. And in this investment for development equation, of course, a regional economic integration has a key role to play. And it's a, if I may, it's a two-way street, the, um, uh, the link between uh, investment and regional integration, because while on one hand, regional integration exerts significant and positive influence on, on economic growth and, and investment opportunities. At the same time, uh, while well, more FDI and trades are, are much needed to build a regional uh, block and uh, to build a larger market, uh, so to create a, a more attractive um, uh, destination for, for, for investment. So I would very much uh, uh, like to echo what Mr. Azu, Azu said in, in terms of opportunities brought about by, well, by the uh, COVID uh, global crisis in terms of near sharing opportunities um, and also uh, about the uh, low hanging fruits uh, quick fix i mean quick fixes uh, measures that could be taken at a uh, country level actually to uh, de facto um, uh, well ease restrictions and and facilitate uh, intra-regional uh, trade uh, in in north africa uh, starting with uh, easing or streamlining uh, fdi and trade restrictions which are higher in in north africa than uh, the global average, as uh, our studies uh, show. Uh, we can send the link to our studies at the benchmark that shows the level of uh, restrictiveness in, in each of the North African countries. Um, but I, I would like to say a few yeah, words. Yes, of... please share the link with us, please. We, we, we want to uh, make yes, it Yes, we will. In, <laughs> I will as soon as I'm, yeah. as I'm done. I would just uh, like to say a few words about uh, uh, on one. Well, first, opportunities for further integration that uh, we do see or that might 
actually arise from the uh, uh, progressive implementation of the African continental free trade uh, uh, area and its uh, investment protocol, which will uh, progressively uh, bring uh, member I mean, yes, uh, member countries to uh, bring their domestic uh, legislations uh, further in line with the uh, uh, global standards that they have collectively agreed on. And I would also like to say just a few words about um, a trend that we we observe in North Africa in in the past year uh, past years, uh, fast paced uh, reforms of of business uh, legislations in each of uh, the uh, countries in North Africa, which uh, de, de facto um, uh, go in the same direction um, and and are being brought closer to. Uh, global standards or so-called best practices in, st in terms of, uh, of uh, business regulation. And it's, it's important to uh, ease uh, trade restrictions and create a more uh, business uh, friendly environment. Yeah, so it's, it's a very positive step that we see, uh, except, except for the um, threat of um, creating a, a race to the bottom when it comes to uh, in, in investment incentives. Uh, we see uh, countries uh, or in North Africa, uh, I mean, sometimes uh, uh, competing against each other by being uh, generous with uh, foreign investors by providing uh, uh, investment tax or non-tax investment incentives. But otherwise, when you look at the um, uh, trend, I mean, at the uh, regulatory reforms that have been implemented in these countries in the past 10 years, it actually goes in the same direction. So that's a positive sign. And yes, here again, if there is a political deadlock within the uh, AMU. I would look at uh, the global, uh, uh, sorry, broader picture at continental level. And here we see a clear opportunity also for North Africa to position themselves as a key uh, a regional block among other regional economic communities, which are uh, more advanced when it comes to, uh, to economic integration, such as uh, uh, SADC uh, or ECOWAS um, to, uh, to cite uh, just a couple of other uh, ACs uh, from which uh, an example could be drawn. And, and just uh, as you, you mentioned specifically uh, the EU policy, but as my colleague Maria Rosa um, said, I mean, we cannot speak on behalf of the EU, whereas the OECD is a completely uh, distinct organization. I would just say that here again, there might be an opportunity in terms of treaty policy and trade policy. Uh, when you look at the most uh, recent uh, developments of the uh, EU uh, investment uh, strategy towards its uh, neighborhood, um, include, uh, especially the southern neighborhood, so the uh, Mediterranean countries, and the uh, new uh, so-called CIFA agreement, Sustainable Investment Facilitation Agreement, that pro uh, are, the first one was signed with uh, Angola a couple of months ago, but they plan to, uh, to uh, start exploring opportunities to, uh, to, uh, to conclude such agreements with uh, North African countries. And that also might be an interesting uh, uh, avenue for further uh, regionalization down the world. Even so, we are at very, very early stage of this new, more flexible uh, policy. Thank you very, very much. I mean, the reason why I was asking about the, um, the EU dimension is because it seems to me from both the EU and the United States have interest in North Africa becoming more stable, more prosperous, um, maybe different. I mean, the, from Washington, I can tell you there is a lot of interest brewing uh, because mainly because of the, uh, uh, the Russia and China are beginning uh, to see the advantage of the region, and as you had mentioned, and its importance for Africa. So uh, the United States is sort of just waking up now to the importance of, of, of North Africa. From Europe, there was always be that interest, but there are very specific advantages. The issue of immigration, obviously, terrorism, the issue of energy, uh, all of these uh, dimensions are very key to the EU, and uh, you know they have a, a stake in making sure that the region is both stable and prosperous, because that's basically the way you're going to get it done. Um, His Excellency asked for a couple of minutes of comments, and then I will take some questions, okay? Uh, thank you. I'd like to get back to the debate. It looks like it's today on debate over the integration. Yeah. Okay, exactly the same problem is posed in terms of short term measure. I remember in 2005, there was a seminar in France over the issue of the cost of non maghreb exactly in the same words. I fully agree with all your relevant suggestions, uh, Mr. Jihad, obviously, uh, 
we cannot deny the necessity uh, to go further. But how? How can we do it? And then, unfortunately, we get back to the basic problems. The political problem, that means the problem of goodwill of the various states, including mine. How can we one day see, identify really the problem and discuss about what we can do together, what we will do together? We are not yet so far to this stage, unfortunately. This does not mean that we have not been achieving anything. I can give you examples, for instance, what we've been doing as Algeria in uh, co commercial cooperation with Tunis. We have a professional agreement, trade agreement, okay, we, 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 which we've been implementing with some success. And we will <coughs> go forward with Mauritania very recently. We have signed important and tremendous uh, trade agreement. We want to open more, even with Libya, even yes. under the current laws and circumstances. We are trying to work. Unfortunately, we cannot do that with Morocco because of the reasons you know. But we are not satisfied with the level of integration. It goes without saying we want to do more. But how? My conviction is that we have to get back and discuss in total confidence, in total clarity, how we should get rid of the problems in order to set create the situation for uh, economic recovery, economic integration. How? We have recently signed the, the Global Free Trade Africa, okay? Uh, free trade, uh, zone of free trade in, in Africa. By the way, we, all the Maghreb countries have agreements of integration, uh, agreements of cooperation, of association with Europe, very advanced, very sophisticated. This leads me to say that we never, we will get to a situation in which basically we will we'll have solved the problems, the political problems, then the issue of integration would come very easy, very simple, and we would be able to implement the fast track barriers, which you talk about, uh, Dr. Jihad, then it would be very, it would be good, we are running very quickly, but you have, unfortunately, we are stuck with a problem which we should not ignore or deny. It is here, and we have to handle, handle it. Speaking about the EU, I was a couple of months ago ambassador to the Algeria to the EU, and I would like to share with you some comments on the interest. It's true that there's a tremendous growth in interest for the uh, Maghreb integration, even though in the past, when we started 20 years ago, negotiating the agreements of association, the EU did all it's possible in order, I'm sorry to state that, to divide the Maghreb countries, it would have been really relevant to go as a block to negotiate a global agreement, trade agreement, okay? We were prevented from that. Second thing, speaking in terms of new policy, neighborhood, neighborhood policy, you know that for now, the trend, for years and years, the trend, the tendency in the EU policy has been to give a sort of preference to the Eastern countries. Now, more than ever, the focus is on Ukraine. And this leads me to ask the question of really the interest of the EU vis-a-vis -vis the Southern countries, all the Southern countries, including the other countries. In terms of what we see in terms of investment, it's not a lot. And my personal fear is that we will receive more in the coming years uh, uh, <clears throat> investment. Speaking about the US interest, of course, in the Maghreb countries, even though we've been working on a bilateral basis, I think their interest is the same work in order to ensure more stability in the region, along with the United States, in terms of stabilizing the country, particularly helping curb the terrorism tendency because there is still persistent terrorism there's activities in the region. We've been working with the US along in order to curb, to eradicate the, the roots of terrorism, in order to stabilize the region in terms of migration. You know, migration for us is not a sort of fatality of history. Migration should be regarded as a normal phenomenon which occurred in history. 
I can tell you from distance that in the 40s of last century, Algeria received tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of migrants coming from Spain, for instance, during the Civil War. Today, the trend is reversed, uh, but we should envisage uh, this aspect in two sides. The first side would be the aspect of solidarity and necessary cooperation between the North and the South. Second thing, there is a security dimension which one should not deny the necessity of, uh, let's say, curbing the uh, network, trafficking networks, etc. And we should work together in order to ensure that those two aspects of would allow us in a state of solidarity in the North as well as in the South back in this issue. Thank you very, very much. Uh, since we don't have a whole lot of time, um, I, I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm to allow the discussion to be from the audience rather than me focusing on some of the points. Uh, I think we've heard some very, very key issues here. One is the potential, the real potential on the economic side to benefit both the region and Africa and globally. I think we've also heard some of the issues strategic uh, that can also um, invite uh, support from the United States, from Europe, from other states, because there is some very strategic reasons why the integration of this part of the world economically, I, you know, forget about the politics, that's not going to never happen. But on an economic level, uh, uh, among people, among private sector and so on, is, is really strategically advantageous for, for both Africa, for Africa, Europe, and the United States, and also for others like China, if, if its participation in the economics of the region, the marine Silk Road that is uh, being planned and in other areas. And I think we've heard uh, very clearly, uh, and thanks to the, His Excellency, the real obstacle here, and it seems to be, you know, if you look at it from a larger perspective, almost trivial when you compare it to the to the advantages. But unfortunately, politics has always been a spoiler and never um, an enabler of, of anything, in my opinion. Um, now, the, the question in my mind is, and that's what I've, I've been interested in, uh, is, is how do you sort of either come to an agreement on a process to solve this political obstacle and allow uh, uh, this integration or a form of it and the encouragement of the private sector, because I've worked on this integration, it's nonsense to think that's gonna come from top down. I think it's really by identifying very specific projects, linking of roads, linking of electricity, uh, joint venture projects that allow the private sector. So removing barriers is all that you need really from governments. It's like, just stay out of our way. And I think the private sector will uh, uh, be able to do something on its own once the barriers are, are gone. And, and how do we explore the idea of how do you sort of either at least come to an agreement on a process to solve the political problem rather than just leave it as it is, blocking everything. I think Algeria's position is very, very clear. Um, and I think also Morocco has a very clear position. The unfortunate part is that uh, Morocco has put its political demands as um, sort of a precondition on everything else, sort of a veto to stop the whole, any economic, any, uh, sorry? Yeah, I mean, it's basically a veto power in a sense that it's stopping everything else. So anyway, um, we have really some very uh, good also colleagues uh, joining us here. I see Dr. Mahmoud Mahideen, which I, Mahmoud, I, I was hoping you're gonna be here with us, but since you are online, you can, you can uh, also throw us a question or a comment from your end. But let me start with the room. Bill, first of all, nice to see you. Nice and you. Uh, please, Mario, after, right? Okay. Since I haven't done it in person. Please continue. introduce yourself, okay? I'm Lawrence, American University, 38 years working on the Maghreb. And uh, since I haven't seen you in person, congratulations on this new Thank initiative. That Thank you. It's been around for a while, but we have a few months uh, Not much. to celebrate it with you. Um, uh, so, and the last two sets of interventions prompt my two questions. Um, uh, but first, let me say, I agree with all the comments about potential strategy barriers, 
you know, studies, like I, everything I agree with um, the question and prompted by His Excellency's comment. I'm going to turn it over to Jihad to answer it. It is well known. Individual countries have an easier time getting concessions from blocks than blocks get concessions from blocks. So, so if I'm Moroccan tomato farmers trying to get accession to sell tomatoes in European markets, it's much easier for me as Morocco to get Spanish and French tomato producers to concede than it is to go in with Tunisia and Algeria and Libya and try to sell dates or tomatoes or whatever. The concessions will be smaller. So the economics question for you and perhaps the OECD folks is how can the IMF and the EU um, uh, incentivize the European Union to deal with uh, the block as a block, right? To help Algeria, help Tunisia, you know, to, to sort of deal with collectivities rather than individual countries, because individual countries are easier to make concessions to. And my question for His Excellency um, has to do with, you know, even though Morocco is a monarchy and it's top down and nothing really happens without the king's blessing. There often seems to be daylight between the, gang, the king and the government at certain key junctures in Algerian Moroccan relations, where the king will sort of be in the conciliatory mode and the government, you know, sabotages it. And it must have been blessed from the top, but why? Like, why would they even venture down these roads to then sort of pull out the rug from under themselves? And, and, and then just one last piece of the question. So I gave a speech in Ujda a couple of years ago on this and, uh, uh, and the Peterson Institute that on one or two points of GDP lost Sorry because of, get your yeah, on because yeah. You don't, so I want to take multiple questions. I'm, I'm just about to, yeah. on lack of integration and, and the Dean of the university said, the entire audience is against you. And I said, why? And they said, because they consider all Algerians terrorists and smugglers. And I said, well, in Clemson, they consider you terrorists and smugglers too. And who's making the case for integration here at the border where this huge informal trade going on constantly in gas and everything else. And the answer was nobody, nobody's making the case to the border communities for integration who, who then become an effective veto to integration across this least traded border in the world. So uh, question for you, question for you. Okay, <laughs> let's take these questions and yeah. then we'll... Uh, yeah. I don't have my glasses. Uh, Ario Cristiani Ario. from the German Marshall Fund. So, uh, actually, a question on uh, when living in Tunisia, my impression was that, uh, let's say, the means for uh, regional economic integrations were motorcycles uh, when visiting Tabarka or like Beja, uh, <laughs> more than other infrastructure. So, on this, I want to ask because it's extremely complicated to move around because of the lack of railways and all these kind of things. Um, don't you think that maybe to start the process of economic integration one way could be to empower regional organizations, for instance, the Arab Maghreb Union, which might have a role. I remember this Trans Maghreb <laughs> Railway project that I think received some funding recently, but at some point, I know there have been some issues recently also regarding the renewal of the Secretary General, et cetera. But in other experiences of regional integration, like this kind of organizations, I don't want to say necessarily the experience of the European community because it was very peculiar, like linked to war, et cetera. But something like this, empowering an organization that instead of being political would work more on functional things. And after that, having a sort of trickle down like integration from the economic sphere to the political sphere i would like to like hear your opinion about okay one last question and then we'll uh it's good to see you thank you nice for, to see you. thank you for coming uh munji Thawedi. i'm tunisian but i'm the executive director of uh, libyan american alliance working uh, on on libya now given the political difficulty that your excellency have mentioned and the huge incentive when we talk about economics and trade why isn't algeria taking a more leading role especially with countries like tunisia and libya where you have no political issues you have a huge advantage in terms of the people welcoming any steps that would be taken by governments uh, in libya we've seen algeria kind of come a little bit late uh, in, into the uh, civil war, uh, we've you know we've seen Haftar almost taken over Tripoli, 
and other countries stepping in even militarily, while Algeria stayed back, yes, there was positive statements. So what, what I'm saying is that why not take these easy uh, steps to integrate or toward the integration uh, so we can, at least if we cannot achieve all of it, we can achieve some of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm just going to add my 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 observation since m multiple of you talked about transportation. My interest in integration actually came about by having a very difficult time one day to make reservations from Morocco uh, to Egypt. And <laughs> while there are flights, uh, you know, via Tunis or via Libya or whatever, oh. it, it, it was much easier. A multiple option if I just go to Europe and yeah, come down. So, it, it was the easiest thing in the world. And you realize how little, even in the lowest possible fruits, uh, you know, in terms of potential integration. Let I'm me sure there was a Luage that could have done the. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I'll let you, Excellency, and then we'll turn to Jihan. Yeah. 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 So I will start with William. Okay, your question is relevant and proves that you have a precise knowledge of the Maghreb society. Now, as Algerian, I can tell you that we are not going to remove Morocco, okay? It's a neighbor uh, which we have to call, we have to work, etc. I don't want to interfere in their own business, okay? I notice exactly what you notice, yeah. is that there is a sort of of the standard in the language, which I resent. As far as I can tell, Algeria has been all the way consistent in terms of language with its goodwill to, to work with Morocco. We have never promised wonderful things and not delivered, okay? All what we say, uh, we do it. And our wish is that we could speak the same language, same language of clarity, the same language of sincere, of political sincerity, in order to uh, achieve in favor of the Maghreb. This is what I wanted to say uh, regarding this uh, issue. Now, regarding the other issue of empowering regions or regional institutions, uh, in order to build the Maghreb, I would like to recall that regarding the railway, the only maybe the few things that is working is the rail. We have the railway, Maghreb railway, okay, from maybe from Marrakesh to Tunis, okay? Not to Libya, I don't think mm -hmm. so, but we had it for, okay? Maybe uh, Gavis or Gafsa. Yeah, it was very Gavis. 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 Yeah. I agree with you that there is a necessity to empower uh, the uh, regional institutions in order to give substance to the Maghreb Arab Union. Regarding the remarks, relevant remarks of Mr. Munji, I agree with you. Uh, Algeria did not advance, want to physically interfere in Libya. Why? Because of the atmosphere of war. Libya was in war. Okay? We have denounced the proxy war organized by foreign countries and foreign forces. And we've been, if I can say so, the only, only country that has started very clearly condemning all foreign interferences, including the Appearances of the presence of foreign forces, non state forces uh, in, in this country. <clears throat> Regarding the political process, we have tried with all our possible, with all possible means to uh, convince all the stakeholders <clears throat> in the two conferences of Berlin, uh, as well as other uh, conferences, of the necessity of helping the Libyans together and set the political situation, political setting it, given the fact that in Libya, unfortunately, uh, there is a lack of, I'm not saying awareness, a lack of, let's say, political society. And this is not an insult to Libya. It's Let me add to this. Since I'm a Libyan, I can insult myself. <laughs> no, no. Uh, there is a lack of everything. No, no. Yeah, we have to, <laughs> no, yeah. There is no political party structures as we see them logically. Yeah. And this is, it makes it very difficult to convince all the parties to come. There are very good personalities, very good <clears throat> patriotic personalities in Libya, no doubt. Regarding the political parties, it's yet a job to be done. This has made very difficult the task of Algeria. And Add to that that we did not want to militarily interfere because it's not our doctrine, the line of doctrine. We will never do that okay? unless unless special conditions occur. And I would like to recall in this context that 
President Tebun, like you yes. underlined, yes. our president, when, when he was elected, okay, and Libya was on the brink of falling uh, under terrorist groups, he said, should Libya, we would never allow Libya to fall under the terrorist groups, uh, that we will never do. But it was a red line, thanks God, that we did not cross. He, he used actually the word uh, miss, missionary, uh, exactly. mercenary. Mercenary. Which he was, he was uh, basically talking about the Russians as they became yeah. right on the borders yeah. of the capital. As so as he, he <laughs> Ambassador referred to indirectly. Yeah. What we've been doing consistently, even though some of our partners were not very happy with our formulation, we are absolutely against. We are the only, only country that has underlined clearly that it is against all foreign forces, which means including mercenaries, uh, including not only mercenaries, but private groups coming, for instance, from uh, the previous Sudanese oh, yeah. opposition. Janjaweed. Okay, yes, there are Janjaweed. groups. Okay, special groups <clears throat> from Chad, for instance, yes. from the Tubu area. No. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's really a mess, which makes the uh, from many countries. Add to that the proxy war organized yes. by foreign countries, brotherly countries. Fortunately, so not so brotherly. <laughs> well, uh, no. How can you? Uh, how can you? Uh, yeah, under that circumstances, try to organize. I think that President Tebun was very wise, calling upon the international community to stop uh, the uh, aggression, the military aggression against Tripoli. Alhamdulillah, it was uh, blocked. And we are we've been very active now uh, in order to, let's say, push towards a national reconciliation of all the Libyan tribes and the Libyan parties also. We think it's important. We think it's very important in order to pave the way for elections, presidential <clears throat> elections and parliamentary elections, inshallah. Uh, Jed, I don't know if you still remember the, the comments. Yeah. I'm just going to add on top of that. It's the yes. same dimension. I haven't heard much on the issue of the uh, situation since the weather doesn't stop at any border, so you cannot tackle it as a national issue. It has to be uh, regional and global. Uh, and how do you see that since this part of the world, as long as with MENA as well, is one of the really most uh, affected regions of the world. How does that affect the, the, both the thinking about uh, uh, integration and how can a coordinated a sort of effort led by the international community can help in, in doing that? Well, first of all, thank you very much. Thanks for those very interesting comments. Um, let me organize my response in four points. One political, second economic, three is about the process and what uh, institutions like us and OECDs uh, could do. Politically speaking, I very much agree. This is an important issue that has prevented the region from moving forward in terms of integration. However, I think organically there is further integration that we that we think if you go to the border between Tunisia and, Lib and, uh, and Libya or between Tunisia and Algeria, you see integration that is happening at an organic level. Politically speaking, also, I saw other experiences whereby removing political barrier or changing the political mindset uh, can have a big impact. I give you an example that is not from the region. Uzbekistan used to be outside, I would say, the, um, its region in terms of uh, political and economic relationship for decades. And in 2017, new change in government, change in government, new team came in, and the only decision was we want to open up. Without doing anything other than that, the level of intra-regional trade or trade between Uzbekistan and neighboring countries have increased on average by 30% over the last two years. Therefore, it tells you that, that definitely the political impulse make a big, a big difference. The second thing is, yes, it's easy to close border when you have 5% intra-regional trade. But when you reach 50% regional trade, it becomes very difficult. And this is why, you know, European pol politicians are forced to coordinate, cooperate more than politicians in Maghreb countries, because 
what you have at stake or the pressure that you are to face is much bigger. Three, related to politics, it's a process. Nobody can achieve a change of this magnitude overnight. And therefore, we need to put things in a timeline and in a process. And the last point on the political, I would say, heading is recently, I see some changes. The Arab League summit in Algiers was an important step. First time since COVID, where head of states have met, discussed issues of, of, of regional interest. There will be another one on economic issues in Mauritania uh, at the end of the year. And I very much encourage Maghreb countries to seize this opportunity to promote better uh, the Maghreb region uh, to the entire community. Uh, by doing so, you become more relevant. And this is, for example, recently the, 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 the summit that happened here between the US and Africa also provided for some of the North African countries the opportunity to showcase why important uh, this part of, uh, and why strategic this part of the world is. Because it will have huge negative or positive impact in terms of migration, in terms of growth, in terms of security, in terms of stability, but over and above in terms of economic opportunities for everyone in the world. Therefore, I think I fully agree that politics is going to be very important, but I think we need to shift the narrative and we don't need to hug each other. We need to start politically, rationally, remove some of the barriers. Economically, what is being hindering the intra-regional trade is little. And I think uh, both my colleagues uh, from OECD and my colleagues from the fund who did uh, recently a paper on Maghreb integration are showing that with um, only chain, small changes, you can, high, you can have high return, okay? In terms of job creations, in terms of growth, in terms of investment opportunities. And it's not only about the state. And here also my plea is to the private sector, especially the large private sector. Uh, also, we need to see more dynamism from the investors community to look at the region uh, 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 and also to think regionally. Therefore, the state has a role to play. The politics has a message to send. But I think also the business community has an important role to play to, I would say, take the lead on that. Institutionally, um, what institutions like us and others could do is first to show the roadmap. And I'm very happy to see that my colleagues have highlighted certain number of important steps that could happen. We will be having a paper on trade integration in Africa that will be presented at the annual meetings that are taking place in Maghreb country, uh, in Marrakesh this uh, October. This is going to be an important moment for the whole Maghreb countries to, to, to have a platform uh, to promote the potential. Therefore, uh, those, uh, um, I would say, uh, uh, analytical um, contributions, the role is to shed light, to a bit give a road a roadmap or to propose a roadmap, okay? Uh, you mentioned the issue of climate. This is an important issue. Uh, again, we recently did uh, a work on adaptation that showed that over the last three decades, a lot of hardship, a decline in inclusion was because of climate issues. And therefore, those are by nature cross-country projects and they can force regional cooperation. Therefore, let's focus on those. We at the fund, we will have a new initiative called uh, 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 um, Resilient and Sustainability Trust that will focus on that exactly and will promote investment in, in long-term transformation. Therefore, let's focus on those. And again, where the world is heading to requires to have, a, a, I wouldn't say a shift in the paradigm, but an adaptation of paradigm. Regional, regionalism is back or at least we need to think regionally, uh, and we need to think how we can create opportunities in the neighborhood. Uh, over the last three decades, opportunities were spread all over the world. COVID and what came after is telling us that you maybe need to look at your neighbors. Uh, Europe is looking at growing uh, wheat in Tunisia. This is something new. Um, 
uh, they are looking at strengthening strategic cooperation in terms of energy, not only getting gas, but developing all kinds of industries around energy with Algeria. Therefore, those are opportunities that they come at the moment. If you seize the moment, you will materialize a dream. And you know, uh, you are a senior fellow for Ibn Khaldun Strategic Initiative. Well, it's now called the North Africa Initiative. Which is, I think, uh, Ibn Khaldun is is someone who you know wrote on these issues, and you know, going back to his writings will help us yes. see the future. Therefore, again, I think not because something that has been relevant did not materialize. It means that it is it is not valid anymore. It's still valid. The only element that uh, I think maybe because we are Friday and heading to a weekend, I'm maybe ending on a positive note that sometimes hard things need an opportunity and the opportunity could be a small, small signal. I see a signal. Oh, that's really yeah. very positive. I like that. Um, I'm going to give the floor to our colleagues in Paris to very quickly give us their final thoughts, and then I will conclude the, the event and, and will thank you, everybody. Please go ahead. We cannot hear you. I think you're mu muted. Okay, well, apparently, uh, Maria Rosa okay. has an issue. Okay. So, okay. Uh, no, no, okay. because I could not unmute my, myself. Um, uh, okay. Yes, I, I would just um, um, uh, follow up on the on the last consideration and uh, about changing, the shifting the narrative, and I think this is very important, but also something that has not yet been mentioned is uh, uh, communicating about the benefits, because I think if, if we consider the recent experience uh, in the European Union and what happened with the Brexit, uh, this was, uh, this became well. quite yes. evident. Thank you. We are doing one now on Africa. That the, that will come there soon. was really a, a, a lack uh, of understanding at all the level of the uh, of the society, including in the in the political class, about what uh, what exactly uh, the uh, an integration would mean, what are the, the benefit, the implications, and and I think and I, I'm not saying that this is the only element that would unblock uh, the political part, but I think there is a, an important uh, work to do in making it much more evident and known at, at the general level. Uh, what what an in, what an integration uh, means, and in particular, all the advantages in terms of uh, of, of potential for stability, addressing uh, uh, new or emerging global challenges, uh, producing, generating more growth, employment. So I think it, I I fully agree on on that, and I would really uh, insist on this change of, change of narrative and, and communication. And last point is uh, that the that the uh, at the OECD the way we support this change in the political process and, and it was uh, said very clearly there is up to a point on which a external actor can can influence is to. Uh, create opportunity for dialogue, or to sit at the same table and to share uh, uh, best practices, to share uh, um, challenges, but also ideas on, on, on solutions that have been applied in a country of the region or in other parts of the country across the world. And, and we have uh, at the OECD a specific uh, uh, main competitive pro programs, uh, for instance, where there are several working groups where all the countries uh, in the region, in the MENA region, participate and we discuss uh, um, public um, uh, private sector development, uh, we discuss uh, traded investment, uh, we discuss uh, um, in the issue of, of uh, in the business integrity. So I think uh, creating opportunity to discuss uh, and exchange is something that can make, uh, uh, can make a change. I'll leave um, um, 
Elaine. Yeah, and if I compliment on what you, you're just saying, uh, Maria Rosa, uh, indeed, we, we do act as the OECD as a facilitator for global policy dialogue. And here, I would like to jump back to a previous uh, comment that was previously made on, on how to um, uh, focus on the economic dimension of uh, regional uh, uh, institutions. And well, I would suggest looking uh, closer at the uh, example or the model of, of ASEAN, which is quite an interesting and, and somehow successful model that's really focused on the uh, economic uh, dimension of regional integration. And uh, one last comment is about the uh, multiplicity of regional economic uh, communities and uh, regional agreements where while I was preparing, reading a little bit before this discussion, I was looking at the um, myriad of overlapping uh, um, uh, trade and investment uh, treaty commitments taken by uh, North African countries, and uh, also uh, like uh, like their like membership in several uh, uh, RECs. And I was wondering, I mean, it's an open question, I don't have the answer. I was wondering whether it was actually a good thing to boost uh, regional integration or whether it was uh, creating uh, an excessively uh, uh, complex uh, landscape for trade and investment uh, regional rules. That's it. Thank you. Can they hear me now? Okay, thank you all very, very much. Let me just uh, uh, conclude with a few words. Um, first of all, of really sincere thanks uh, for His Excellency, for Dr. Jihad, for our colleagues from Paris. Uh, it's really um, a joy to have you here, share your thoughts and your experiences on the region. Um, the topic, as you can all tell, is an important topic. I think it's an increasingly gonna be um, uh, getting more attention. Um, unfortunately, we all know politics will only help uh, when it comes in an advantage to them. And I think there is a strategic now political advantage for the United States, for Europe, as I said, to try to help in this process. Um, I think the, you know, uh, Jihad's uh, pointing out to some of very practical entry points uh, that are low hanging fruits is a very key suggestion. Uh, we will be hosting in the future other events and we will be hosting uh, the ambassadors of, of the various countries on North Africa. So I invite all of them to also uh, think of us. Uh, we will be happy to host events on the region, uh, any visiting uh, scholars or uh, uh, officials they should consider this initiative really as a home for them to sort of air some of these topics out, um, and especially on the US relationship with the region, which is something that our students and faculty here are second to none in terms of their expertise. Um, this is one of the highest ranking uh, uh, colleges in the world when it comes to international relations. So we want to do that. Uh, we will be hosting His Excellency separately in the future, as well as Dr. Jihad, on a much larger scale, I hope. Uh, so I want to thank you all, especially those who took the trouble of coming all the way here and going through uh, our building. Next time is going to be a much nicer, a fancier building. We we just, uh, you know, as you know, we are renovating the, the museum uh, right next to the Capitol building, and uh, it's going to be our headquarters. So by next year, you, you'll come into a much fancier campus. This is, a, I think it served its purpose over, over the <laughs> decades. Uh, yes, all sites and parts of John Hopkins from Baltimore. I, I, August. It's, August is the final, but I think it starts off from uh, the spring, you know, April, May, we, we start moving some of our stuff, but we will have better facilities for conferences, for 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 uh, sort of uh, bringing together voices across the, the the all of the topics we follow. Thank you all very very much, and I th I'm happy we are not really that late. So uh, so it's a really Thank good you. thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.